One, two, three. Okay, bon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to see you here and to introduce Ivan Krastyev. Uh, I'll first read out his titles and then perhaps say a word about his work. He is the chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia. He is a permanent fellow of the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, and he is now a fellow of the Bosch Stiftung in Berlin. Let me add that Ivan is one of the most articulate commentators on post-communist Europe. Uh, he has uh, developed an expertise and an authority on matters uh, such as corruption, democratization, transparency. And I understand that he is now preparing a book on Russia. And today he will talk to us about uh, Russia's role in Ukraine. Uh, under the heading, more or less, of what does Russia want. Welcome, Ivan. Thank you very much for the opportunity and the invitation. And I really feel privileged. Uh, these days, only who is lazy is not talking about Russia and Ukraine. So this is why I'll try to be brief and just present in front of you an, an argument. And this argument is going to be much more trying to answer three simple questions. The first, why we were so surprised by Russia's actions in Ukraine. Secondly, what are the sources of Russia's behavior? And thirdly, basically, what should be the objective of a certain Western policies uh, in the context of this crisis? But before you start this, I want to tell you a story which for me is going to be part of a kind of methodological introduction. In this city, Geneva in 1962, a young Russian officer, KGB officer, Yuri Nusenko, approached an American diplomat and said that he's very much ready to sell certain information to the Americans for money. And the reason he went for this was not a highly ideological reasons. Simply, he invited a prostitute to his hotel room. She has stolen his money. Uh, $250, then there were real money. And basically, he knew that if he cannot return the money, uh, he's never going to be allowed to travel abroad. So the Americans agreed. They gave him the money. And in 1963, the guy defected. He went to the United States, and he basically told them that he was the KGB officer, which was asked to review the Soviet file of Lee Harvey Oswald. This was the guy who shot Kennedy and asked the Americans, are they interested to know what is there? Americans were interested. And they started debriefing him. And they have been debriefing and debriefing. And they start to feel very nervous, because there was a lot of inconsistency in what he was telling. Basically, he was pretending to know things which, according to them, he should have not known, knowing the regulations. At the same time, basically, he claimed that he don't know things that they believe he should know, knowing which department he works on. Uh, so the head of the American counterintelligence decided he is a plant. And basically, he was sent by the Soviets in order to confuse the American thinking on the Kennedy assassination. For five years, he was kept in prison. There was a very harsh interrogations. But in 1968, he was released. And now when they opened, basically, the KGB files, it appeared that he was not a plant. He was not sent to confuse anybody. But it was true. He was inconsistent, and he was lying. But he was lying for, different, very, for the reason very different than the CIA people believed. He was lying because he was a failure. He was the son of a Soviet minister, but he was a drunkard. He was a heavy womanizer. He never managed to make a career. So he was pretending to the Americans that he was much more important than he was, because he never wanted to confess that he was a personal failure. I'm saying this because part of our problem in trying to read or misread Russia's behavior is that when Westerners analyzes Russia, we never know how to take messiness and failure seriously. There is either people who all the time insist how weak or dysfunctional Russia is, and the next sentence is to claim basically how well organized it, how well functioning machine it is, basically that everything that is happening very much is what they wanted to do. I'll try to basically 
give you my reading of the situation of the sources of Russia's behavior, very much trying messiness seriously. Uh, and I will start with the first fact why there was such a surprise uh, when Mr. Putin basically announced that Russia is going to annex uh, Crimea. First of all, there was, by the way, surprise not only on the Western side. I was in April in Moscow, and I have been talking to a lot of Russian senior officials, asking only one question, have you been surprised by the decision of your government to annex Crimea? Every single person told me yes. So nevertheless, that there was, and now this is quite well known, a military planning some years before how this could happen. The political decision obviously was taken in the last moment. But I do believe that Western misreading of Russia's behavior has three very important reasons. First is that uh, the West managed to convince itself that Russia does not have an interest in challenging European order, and that nevertheless that Russians have been very much voicing their displeasure with certain developments in Europe, displeasure with certain Western policies. To a certain extent, it was a theater. And the Munich uh, speech of Mr. Putin also was a theater because the analysis on the Western side was that the Russians very well know uh, that everything on the Western front in a certain way is fine. What Russia really fears is China and the radical Islam, but because they fear this, they don't want to talk about this and they do prefer to talk about West because there is no problem there. This is something which became kind of a very strong shared paradigm amongst many European and American policymakers, and especially in Europe, this was very much due to the fact that European Union cannot imagine how anybody can be afraid of it. European Union perceives itself as the most vegetarian political power, uh, and from this point of view, anybody who basically <coughs> declared that uh, basically Europeans uh, can be perceived as an aggressor basically was taken as uh, kind of not to be taken seriously. The second thing which was extremely important was uh, that uh, Western analysis were very strongly pointing out that nevertheless that Russia managed economically to recover after the totally destructive 1990s, Russia is much weaker in military, in political, in economic terms in order to be a challenge to the international order. And people basically said, and this was the assumption, this is only the rising powers who are really going to challenge the international order. This is why everybody was very much closely watching China. While well, Russia was basically a declining power that is experiencing a temporary revival because of demography, because of the nature of economy, because don't forget, economic growth in Russia was quite impressive during uh, Putin's years. But if you are going to subtract the part that is coming from the rise of the prices of oil and gas, you're going to see that basically it was under 1%. So from this point of view, it was very much one-dimensional economy. And the third reason why the Europeans basically was very much surprised was because our major understanding, and this was the very assumption of European order, was that economic interdependence makes war impossible. The more we are trading with each other, the more basically difficult and irrational it is to expect that somebody is going to intervene. OK, I'm saying and pre trying to present these three arguments because I do believe in a fundamental way they have been wrong. They were wrong because Russia is, was really and is a status quo power when it comes to the global order. And this is very clearly seen in the way, for example, Russia is defending the United Nations where it has a permanent seat on the Security Council. And basically, Russia also understands that in a global world, if there are going to be a major transformation, it can much more lose than win, but when it comes to European order, Russia basically understands European order to be based on the principles which are different than the global order. And in a certain way, Russia is right. Because after 1989, the European order, which was established and which was very much modeled on the European Union, was very much based on certain type of principles who are not acting in the other parts of the world. For example, interference in each other political domestic affairs, much more security based on transparency, much more basically trying to understand international relations in terms of the rules of law. 
this is not basically, this idea of a post-sovereignty order is not something that is shared, even by democratic states like India, for example, in a global level. So the European order that had been born in 1989, paradoxically, was one that for a while was accepted by Soviet Union, but never very much by Russia. And I'm going to tell you why. In 1989-1990, during the unification talks about Germany, Soviet Union was in a way interested in all this European vision about constraint sovereignty, put sovereignty, because for them, this was an argument to try to resist the separatist tendencies within the Soviet Union itself. Uh, Soviet Union under Mr. Gorbachev was seeing European order as the way to preserve Soviet Union as a state, not as a communist state, but as a state. And paradoxically, all these European orders, all the major documents, including the Paris Charter, was signed not by Russia. They have been signed by Soviet Union. Russia came as a separatist project. Russia came out of the collapse of the idea of the post-national state. They didn't share this sensitivity. For them, sovereignty was extremely important. In a certain way, they didn't very much believe in all this type of a soft sovereignty concept. And for them, the idea of this European order, which was based on the idea of a different nature of borders, because if you go back after the World War I, the idea was that the only way to secure peace is to change the borders, to redraw the borders, to create new states. After 1945, we are not changing the borders, but we are basically exchanging populations in order to secure the borders. After 1989, the idea was we are not changing borders, we are not exchanging populations, but we are changing the nature of the borders. For the Russian, this was a problem. And it is a problem because 43% of the Russian populations a year ago were not sure that the borders of their country, which are now a permanent. By the way, some of them expected them to go far away, but others have been much more fearful that they're going to lose territories, especially with the South Caucasus. And I do believe that this misunderstanding of the nature of the Russia's perception of European order was behind many of the policies kind of misreading coming from the Western side. We managed to convince ourselves that European order is a win-win game. Russians has the feeling that they're losers. And do you know, it's very difficult and very painful to be a loser when somebody is telling you that you're living in the world without losers. Uh, because even you don't have the right, basically, to complain about being a loser. Uh, and this was very kind of, uh, uh, in my view, important. The second reason about uh, why we misread them is our very perception of strengths and weakness. The West was trying to see the strengths and weaknesses very easily to be objectified. I have read hundreds of papers which compare the trade flows, the military spending, the technological developments between, for example, NATO and Russia, and this is really a joke. This, this is, Russia cannot compare to the NATO in terms of military capacity, economic capacity, or political capacity. That's the fact. But we are living in a strange age. Uh, uh, there was a very famous and very interesting project done by scholars in Harvard on asymmetrical wars. And this project, empirical project, came with the following funding, uh, finding. In the period 18, 1850, 1800, 1850, the weaker power has prevailed in a war against a stronger power defined by wealth and military capacity in 12% of the cases. But in the period 1950 to 1988, in 55% of the cases. It became kind of a rule that the weaker are prevailing because the very idea of prevalence and basically prevailing means managing to secure uh, their strategic objectives was not so much winning but basically disrupting, disrupting the work of the stronger party, basically trying not to allow them to control the situation. And I do believe this is quite important, and this is very much uh, expresses uh, part of the tactics coming from the Russia's hybrid war, because it was a challenge to the European order, but this was the challenge from the position of the weakness, and this was the position of the recognized weakness. Not weakness with respect to Ukraine, but weakness with respect to the West. What is also extremely interesting is that the very idea of strengths and weakness has also a totally different 
dimensions in the personal experience of the Russian leadership. Listen, we're saying that now Russia is weak compared to NATO. But when Putin became a president, or even before prime minister in 1999, he was acting from the position of a total weakness. Yeltsin establishment was totally <coughs> delegitimized. Russian economy was after 1998 crisis. So for him to win from the point of view of weakness was something that he believes basically is his speciality. And don't forget, he's not coming from chess. He's coming from judo, where basically the problem of strengths and weakness is very much how you're basically manipulating, uh, uh, how you're manipulating the energy of the other side. And the third reason why basically we have been in a certain wrong of reading Russia was that why we have been sure that economic interdependence means no aggression. What Russians has discovered is that economic interdependence means also that when somebody decided to start an aggression, it's much more difficult to respond. Uh, and from this point of view, we came with a situation in which I do believe uh, this explains, at least in my view, partially why basically the West was so unprepared uh, and didn't know how to react at the moment when the Russia takes this decision. But then came the story why Russia decided to do what they did. And here we have two very strong school of thoughts. You're going to see them every day, basically, even on the level of the newspaper articles. One is the classical realist, and George Merchheimer has this uh, very popular article in the last issue of the Foreign Affairs, who said, basically, Russia is doing what it is doing because they're acting like a classical realist power, defending their legitimate strategic interests. So the only difference between the West and Russia is that they're not buying our liberal framework of what international security is, and they're doing what states have been normally doing over the years. And there is another school who basically said, Russia simply has recovered from their weakness, and they're doing what they always have been doing, like in the old joke. And the old joke is, who are the countries that border Russia? And the right answer is, whom they want and who Russia wants to bother them? And the right answer is nobody. Uh, uh, so from this point of view, there was also this school of the traditional imperialism, Russian imperialist behavior, which is very popular, especially with some of the East Europeans. Uh, my colleagues who basically said why we should be so surprised they're doing what they're always doing when they can do it. The argument which I will try to present to you is that I do believe that the source of Putin's behavior has not much to do with the strategic uh, interest uh, of Russia, and not much to do with the traditional Russian imperialism, what we witness much more is a very strong policy of aggressive isolationism, and it very much presents the Russian version of reaction against the globalizations and perils of globalization. Russia, in a way, is revolting against the idea of the economic interdependency. And what we are seeing is a policy that its major objective is basically to diminish Russia's political, to some extent economic and cultural contacts with the West, in particular Europe, and as a result of it to reduce the vulnerability of its own government. And when I said government and regime, I do believe that distinctions between democratic and authoritarian just on this level does not explain much. What explains much more if you go and look closer to the nature of the crisis that Putin government has experienced in 1911, 1912 to understand what he is doing, and I will claim that this policy of the confrontation with the West started before uh, the Ukrainian crisis and simply picked with this. And here is basically the core of my argument. Listen, in order to understand Putin's regime, you should try to be able to answer two very simple questions. And the first is, why Mr. Putin is rigged elections which he can easily win? Most, most of Putin opponents have agreed that if he has been running in 2004 or 2012 an elections which are free and fair, he was going to win the elections. But at the same time, everybody who had been following Russian electoral process know that what was in Russia was not free and fair elections. The elections have been rigged. And the second question is, if you are rigging elections, why are you doing this in the way that everybody knows that they are rigged? This is not 
that Russia basically was rigging the elections in the way basically to hide, just the opposite. With everything uh, that Mr. Putin has been doing, he was trying to show everybody that he's manipulating, controlling the election results. And the major argument is that in a paradoxical way, exactly the rigged elections, which are not protest by the population, was at the source of the legitimacy of the regime. Because the major ideology of the Putin regime was there is no alternative. There is no alternative. And he, through the way to show that he can rig the elections and that nobody is going to protest, he really managed to prove that there is no alternative. He had a democratic legitimacy, but also authoritarian legitimacy. And he's getting his authoritarian legitimacy without putting million people in camps and without basically having a mass violence. This was challenged in a big way in the winter of 2011, 2012, when hungry thousands of people went on the streets, mainly of Moscow, to protest against rigged elections. This source of legitimacy had been totally contested. And what we saw after this protest was a regime change. But we didn't see it because for us regime change was the removal of Mr. Putin. But Mr. Putin remained, but he changed the nature of the regime. For example, uh, I was talking to one of the, his major campaign uh, uh, advisors, and he said, our major strategy always was depolitization. We don't like on the street people who shout against Putin, but we also don't like people who shout for Putin because we don't like shouting people. Uh, and, and this was very important. This is very important. This changed because when the anti-Putin shouts came on the street of Moscow, this was not the game anymore. Secondly, and this is very important in the analysis. Uh, by the way, Mr. Putin is convinced that both the protest in Moscow and Kiev has been sponsored and organized by the West. You're going to tell me this is not true, and I believe it's not true. He does not believe it. And the reason he does not believe it is also simple. He had this type of a very strong uh, political mentality. So when he sees 1,000 people on the street, the question is not why, but who. Uh, but the problem is that it is whom he's reacting. This is him who reacts. And as a result of it, he basically believes that his regime has become vulnerable, and he has seen the vulnerability of his regime in the winter of 2012, not because there were 100,000 on the stream asking for Russia without Putin, but because his, regime, his own elite, his closest lieutenants, were not very much interested to crush the street. Everybody was proposing Mr. Putin to negotiate with the crowd. Everybody was telling him, I know them, allow me to negotiate with them. And then basically in Putin analysis, the major vulnerability of the regime was the fact that his own elites was too much politically, financially, and culturally dependent on the West. He said their bank accounts are in the Western banks, their kids are starting, uh, studying in the Western universities. This is why, when confronted by the West, they are not ready to react. So the new regime should be based on the nationalization of the elites, not nationalization of the assets. And before the Ukrainian crisis started, there were several important pieces of legislation. First was Russian Duma voted a legislation which is not allowing senior government officials to have bank accounts in the Western, in the foreign banks, not only Western banks. Uh, there was a very strong pressure to put these people basically to cut uh, some of their uh, relations with the West. But listen, this is Russia. He pushed for this. He pushed for diversification, the diversification of trade. He wanted much more to trade with China. It is easy to be said, but not easy to be done. Because the same governmental officials, they have been looking at the West as the insurance company against basically the authoritarian power of Mr. Putin himself. Why do you put all your money in Russian assets? Mr. Khodorkovsky did it, and he was not happy with the results. Uh, so from this point of view, nevertheless, that there was this push it didn't give the needed results. And secondly, the Russian government started for many people this very strange and unexplained war against the sexual minorities. Listen, for years, 1990s, and so on. There was a lot of sociological uh, opinion being done. Not that Russian society was very tolerant or enthusiastic about sexual minorities, but this was not the issue. Suddenly, the problem of gay marriages and homosexuality was constructed as a major political threat. 
And this has a lot of and very strong tradition, in my view, in the Russian prison, <laughs> prison culture, where this is way of humiliating, basically, the other. This has, in my view, a very important sources in the generational differences, where you have these fathers, members of the Russian elites, and their sons who go to the boarding schools, and it appears that they are not sharing the same type of social and cultural values. But also, if you see the language which is used, basically, the language and the verb that is used for making somebody a homosexual is the same that is used for recruiting an agent. The idea was that homosexuality was defined in the Russian political discourse as a political ep epidemics used by the West, very similar to each other. If you look at Kazakhstan, Belarus, or Russia, you're going to see that basically there is one country and two appendixes. Uh, also, people said, listen, this very geopolitical idea of Eurasianism is the way to move uh, Russia outside of uh, uh, the European space. But I do believe that at the present situation, probably the best way of, Russia, of the European Union to engage with Russia is starting to negotiate, not with Russia, but with the Eurasian Union, which officially is going to be recognized in 2015, January 1st, 2015. And here are my four arguments for this. First, unlike the Russia's world, Eurasian Union is an economic project. It's based on the idea of economic functionality and interdependence. And from this point of view, it stays in the terms of understanding security, which is much closer to us. It's not ethnic. And especially, it's very much reduces the fear of a very strong anti-immigrant pogrom and sentiments in Russia, which could easily pick up in this nationalistic atmosphere. But secondly, when you are negotiating with the Eurasian Union, we have a much more leverage over countries like Belarus and Kazakhstan than we have above Russia. And these countries, nevertheless, that they are not basically as equally important, according to the constitution of this same Eurasian Union, basically have a veto rights in the same way Bulgaria can veto European Union, not that we're going to do it. Uh, so I'm saying all this because in a certain way, uh, if this analysis of Russia's behavior having as major strategic objective, closing the country to the West, shows that we should not do what Russia wants us to do. And I'm going to end with a joke. In my view, this joke is also methodological in its nature. In the center of Paris, a masochist met a sadist. And the masochist said, beat me, torture me. But the sadist said, I will not. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we have about 40 minutes for questions. Please identify yourselves. And there is a microphone which will be circulated. And do try to keep your questions short so that as many people as possible can intervene. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Calomini. I work for the ITU. I just have a question concerning what you said about the Eurasian Union. I mean, uh, behind the Eurasian Union is the idea of Eurasianism. Uh, the founded by Gumilev and by the old school, uh, the old immig Russian immigrants in Paris, in France, and so on, and uh, renovated by Alexander Dugin. The only thing with this ideology is that it's, it pushed Russia to go east, but on the other side, the people that really conceive this ideology have Western mind, Western thinking. The Russian immigrants were educated in Western Europe. And even the, the um, ideological roots, premise of this concept is founded on uh, Western science. So the idea, is it really this idea of uh, going east? I have difficulty to, to believe this idea of going east from Russia. Because they always say, yes, we want to go east to go to, to discuss with the nomads, to discuss with the Central Asian people. But on the side, they, they kind of never really they don't really want to, to see the opposite side. They don't really want to go toward China. They, it's a kind of more reflection than really adhesion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I do believe it's extremely important to distinguish between Eurasianism as a political trend, and by the way, as a political fashion in Russia, and the Eurasian Union as a political reality now. 
uh, because I very much agree with, uh, with you about Mr. Dugin. Mr. Dugin is a great product of European postmodernism. I had the pleasure to have met him several times. This is as if you go on a theater. Uh, he's look like Russian peasant. He's dressed like a Russian peasant, and basically he looks like uh, somebody coming from the church. Uh, but when basically you start listening to him, all his language, all his major concepts are coming from much more postmodern French tradition than from any type of a Russian traditionalism. Uh, and by the way, his English is absolutely fluent. Uh, so all this idea of Eurasianism was try to keep Russia globally important and having an identity of its own. I do believe that the very idea of creating a civilizational state was very important for Russia. The idea of cultural identity in the Russian view of solidarity, of uh, sovereignty is one of the major definition of it. And don't forget, the end of history of Fukuyama never was a bestseller in Russia. But Huntington's The Clash of Civilization was. So from this point of view, who are we? Is not an easy question to be answered in Russia. And one of the interesting stories about traditionalism is that this type of a very radical version of traditionalism also very much expressed through this war on sexual minorities and others is something that keeps together Muslim radicals and radical orthodox supporters. Basically, all of them share this. Uh, so, but I don't believe that Mr. Dugin is really politically influential in Russia. Uh, from time to time, I do believe that uh, Putin is using people like Dugin, showing them, basically trying to scare here and there, but I don't believe that he's behind the idea of the Eurasian Union. Behind the idea of the Eurasian Union, strangely enough, have been some of the economic liberals who started to lose power in Russia for the last two, three, four years, and who said, let's try to imitate European Union. We're not going to be part of the European Union, and it was quite obvious. We want to have a zone of its own, but let's reintegrate our zone on the economic principles. So you have Mr. Kristenko, who is basically the, uh, the head of the Eurasian Union and others. This was, in my view, the last battle of the economists to stay relevant, because one of the things that happened for the last one year, especially with the Ukrainian crisis, is that not simply Mr. Kudrin, who this other person, but the very power of the economic liberals has been very much diminished in the Russian policy making. So from this point of view, I'm very much distinguished between Eurasianism uh, as political trend and philosophical trend in Russia and the Eurasian Union as a political construct, not by accident. Uh, you have people now like Mr. Dugin who likes much more the idea of the Russia's world. Uh, basically, Dugin is the one who is very much pushing that Russia should integrate Eastern Ukraine within the Russian territory. Uh, he has been clashing now openly with uh, uh, the, the Putin circle himself on this. These people very much see Eurasianism as Russian identity politics. For some of these people, including especially the Kazakhs and Belarus, this is acceptance of a sphere of influence, but much more in economic terms. So this is why I do believe that there is a possibility for a much smarter double game. Thank you. Another question, if there is one, yes. Hi, thank you very much for this very interesting um, speech. My question is concerning the, my name is Gabriel Figlistala and I'm working at the ICRC at the moment. Uh, my question is concerning the the protest we have seen in the in the last days. It was saying about twenty thousand people. Many of them have been on the street for the first time, and I was wondering if you would interpret that as a sign that this isolationism of Putin is failing, and if that will have will influence the current regime, maybe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for this question, because I, I don't believe that the data which we have, and I have been, uh, we had a lecture in Vienna just four days ago by Lev Gutkov, the director of the Levada Center. If you read the public opinion polls, there are three things that are really stunning. The first is around 80% is the support for Mr. Putin and his policies. 78% of the Russians believe that there is a major external enemy against them. So you have what Putin called the overwhelming majority. Secondly, and this is much more interesting, support for Putin is strongest in the center that have been protesting against Putin in the winter of 2012. 
because it was the middle classes that he had been looking for some type of values in politics that he had been protesting against Putin, and now some of them are very much rallying uh, against the idea of uh, greater Russia and basically Russia having the world. But at the same time, something which is extremely important is that these groups, while they very much support the idea that Russia should be respected, that Russia should be a power of its own, they cannot imagine the world outside of this bigger global space because this is the people who travel, this is the people who are interested in the world, this is the most mobile part of the population. And to be honest, these 20,000 that have been 30,000 on the street yesterday, you cannot imagine what kind of a personal courage and integrity is needed for these people to go. Because if before the pressure was from government, now they have pressure from their neighbors, from kind of these nationalistic sentiments. And the existence of this Russia that went on the streets knowing that they're a minority is something that I do believe on the West we are not, not ready to recognize, not ready to understand how difficult for these people is. I had been, when I was in, in April in, in Moscow, I went to one of the major bookstores. And there was a poster in the bookstore. And there was five of the faces of basically people who disagree with Putin's policy. So you have the famous rock musician Makarevich, you have the famous writer Kunin, you have Navalny, and the text was uh, the faces of the fifth column. So the pressure on these people is incredible. But these people show and demonstrate because they have the feeling that it is not just about politics, but it's really about the identity of Russia. Uh, as a political space, I don't believe that these 20 or 30,000 in the moment represent something more than a very small minority in Russia. On the long run, I do believe that this isolationist policy has a huge problem of its own. First, because economically, there were some Russian economists who expected that now when Russia is going to close itself, Mr. Putin is going to push for slightly more competition in order to make the import substitution to work. This is not the case. What you see basically is a bureaucratic wars in which Mr. Sechin basically is taking uh, the assets of the others. Uh, but on the other side, also the Russian society to go on the east. Which east exactly? China, it's kind of nice to talk to China politically, but Russians don't know much China. They don't travel much more to China. And I do believe that this isolationism in the long term is very difficult to be sustained. But this isolationism is also a problem for the West, and this is at least my major kind of conceptual argument which I want to make to you. Uh, everybody believes that the tensions in international politics that we see in the last two, three years, basically after the uh, financial crisis, are much more coming from the rivalry of the big powers, I mean, Americans, Chinese, Russians, and so on. In my view, we see something slightly different. The major factors that shape these tensions is the internal instability of all big powers. Mr. Putin goes in Ukraine to stabilize himself inside, and not because he's so much interested to get this or that part of land. But this type of internal instability, of course, makes this policy so difficult to be predicted. Because if you're going to ask me what he's going to do next, I don't know. Because it is going very much to depend on the domestic political considerations, and not simply on a strategic idea that you want this part of Ukraine or this type of a solution for Ukraine. I do believe that it also makes uh, the international politics much more unpredictable than people are ready to admit. Thank you. Yes, someone has the microphone. Does it work? Okay. Um, I'm Olga Kavun from the permanent mission of Ukraine to the uh, United Nations here in Geneva. Thank you very much for your uh, information and I would say very fresh approach to this uh, crisis. I uh, would keep my question very short. Uh, how about Ukraine? How do you see uh, ways of resolving this crisis? and the role of the United Nations and other international organizations uh, in this. Thank you. Listen, I'm not a specialist on this, and what I'm going to say is going to be very much reflections on my experience with the Balkan crisis and basically what I have seen during the Yugoslav crisis. One of the major things that happened in Ukraine was also type of a identity transformation. If uh, they should be a monument of the Ukrainian nationalism in Kiev these days, it should be a monument of Mr. Putin. Uh, because at the moment when uh, he basically uh, grabbed Crimea, a totally different type of the Ukrainian nationalism has been born. Uh, 
And honestly speaking, the Russian-speaking Ukrainians in many parts of Ukraine are some of the most radical exponents of this type of uh, 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 Ukrainian nationalism because these people had an identity in which till yesterday being part of the Russian culture and living in the Ukraine was not a problem. Now they have been forced to choose. And because they have been forced to choose, they made a very kind of a tough choice of their own and they're never going to forgive that they have been pushed to do this choice. Uh, I'm saying this because Ukraine, in my view, now is going to face a very unpleasant choice. One is uh, to go with a Dayton type of Ukraine, basically, basically trying to make out of the Ukraine a new Bosnia, you're federalizing, uh, you, which means that you're going to have the borders of the Ukrainian states being internationally recognized, you're coming with the federal solution, but the major risk is, like with what we see in Bosnia, paralysis of the state apparatus for a long period of time. It sounds very well on paper. It does not work very well on the ground. Uh, because then, for different reasons, and by the way, Russia is not the only reasons, and I don't believe that Russia explains all the dysfunctionality of Ukraine, honestly speaking. Ukraine was dysfunctional to a great extent before this crisis too. Uh, the problem is that the federalization is going to come with such a complicated and complex constitutional arrangement, which is going to make very difficult for the Ukrainians to recover from kind of embedded type of dysfunctionality which comes with the post-communist transition. The other possibility is part of Donbass as a frozen conflict, because I don't believe that it's a possibility uh, to, to join Russia's federation. I don't believe that this is in the cards of the Russian policymakers. I could be wrong. Frozen conflict means two things. It means that basically the European Union and the West are not going to be forced to pay for the recovery of Donbass, but it also means that de facto Donbass is going to be in a relations with Russia like the other frozen conflicts uh, in the post-Soviet territory. And don't forget that probably now in Europe we have more frozen conflicts and unrecognized state than we have in Africa. Uh, it's very nice to see how people tell the story about Europe being totally uneventful place in the last 25 years. Listen, in Europe in the last 25 years have been born much more states than in any other place and continent than Africa in the 1960s. It is the biggest state construction site in the world. Uh, and from this point of view, this should not be, I do believe that this should not be underestimated. How this is going to be uh, decided for me, it's very difficult because to know, because this is going to be very much also domestic Ukrainian politics. Where is role for the United Nations? I do believe that the United Nations is not going to be the major player because of the Russia's uh, veto in the Security Council. Uh, also, this is quite interesting, but it's quite obvious after Mr. Poroshenko's visit uh, to Washington that basically he prefers at this moment the United States as a third party, probably because of the military nature of the threat, than the European Union. And of course, for the European Union, this is going to be a difficult position too. But when I was talking in the beginning between schizophrenia on our side, uh, on one side believing that Russia is a totally weak state, on the other side believing that it's a perfect functioning machine. Uh, there was uh, reports in the media that uh, when uh, Mrs. Merkel called uh, Mr. Putin uh, some weeks ago asking him a very kind of unpleasant question, what uh, a column of your tanks are doing 80 kilometers within the Ukrainian territory, Mr. Putin smiled and said, you know how corrupt we are, probably somebody has sold them. Uh, so, uh, so from this point of view, we are on this, we're on this level, and I don't know, honestly speaking, knowing Bosnia, I don't believe it's a good solution for Ukraine. Uh, but basically, if you know South Society, this is not a good solution too. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Thank you so much. There's a question back there, yes. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Anatoly Bayshov, uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, let me express my high gratitude for being present today. Uh, my question is as follows. Uh, should we overestimate the danger which is coming always from Russia? <coughs> because uh, still following your argument, and thank you for your economical argument especially, uh, we always remember the veto uh, right of the Russian Federation in the Council, but we never speak about the veto of the other, of the other fourth players, especially if we are speaking about the Parliamentary Assembly <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. in the Council of Europe, when there was uh, an initiative uh, following from uh, the Russian Federation to uh, set uh, some kind of dispute settlement on the territory of Ukraine, uh, 
the Russian delegation from the parliamentary assembly was blocked and uh, had to <laughs> run away, I, w I would say. In this case, uh, probably to continue your argument and to continue the conclusion, probably to start uh, and to continue the negotiating processes. Probably we should also estimate uh, the other powers and be kind of objective. Thank you so much. No, listen, I uh, believe that, of course, the easiest is to blame Russia for everything. It's also going to be dishonest to give her amnesty for everything. Uh, so what I see as a major problem now is that the relations between Russia and the European Union in uh, particular, the level of trust is almost to the zero level. Uh, from this point of view, how are you rebuilding a trust in this situation? Because Mr. Putin did not occupy simply Crimea. He destroyed Europeans' view of the way Europeans believed Europe functions. Uh, this, is, this is much more dramatic. For, and this is not simply connected to the fact that Russian media, let's say, overperformed. Uh, uh, this is not due to the fact that you have funding for this or that political parties on the, uh, the right-wing specter uh, of uh, support for anti-European uh, parties. The problem was that Europeans believe that they are living in a special place in which the war is really impossible because of the economic arguments, because we are so much gathered together. And then you walk up and you're living in a totally different world. And from this point of view, start asking questions. Which is this world? What Mr. Putin wants? By the way, uh, the psychological explanations are also basically picking up. I do believe that there should be certain things that are going to happen. Some of them are going to be in Ukraine itself, and it's very difficult how you're monitoring processes and others. Organization for Security and Cooperation of Europe here has a role to play. The organizations which are not going to be well positioned to play are exactly the organization like the Council of Europe. Because the idea of the Council of Europe was that all members are sharing some of the basic values, including, including the idea that the human rights are more important than the rights of the state. Mr. Putin made a very strong statement, I mean, practical statement, uh, that Russia is not buying this, for good or bad reason. Basically, they're not buying this. Not by accident, he violated the most important kind of strongest taboo that exists in European politics, vi viability of borders. Because you can violate here and there. So from this point of view, we are going to have a totally different type of a negotiations. These negotiations are coming from not the idea that we're sharing the same values, but that we're sharing the same space. And sharing the same space, we should try to find a way to work together and to live together, because obviously not the European Union is going to disappear, not Russia. I don't believe that the Council of Europe is going to be the place, for example, where the normalization of the relationship is going to come first. Thank you. Yes, uh, question there. Uh -huh. uh, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, my name is Jean-Luc Bouilleur. I teach in a school across the, across the border. I wanted to go back to the role of a civil society in Russia. Uh, to uh, Russian public opinion, the situation in Ukraine has been presented as a strictly uh, internal uh, affair, uh, Ukrainian civil war. So my question is, to what extent uh, are the people in Russia aware that uh, a, a war is being waged uh, with uh, Russian troops? Uh, how much are they aware about the, the soldiers' uh, mothers? And what would be their reaction in case they really become aware of that uh, war situation involving Russia? Uh, thank you very much for the question, because uh, at least it gives me an opportunity to make a point which, from my view, is quite important. Uh, one of the reasons Mr. Putin did what he did was also how the situation developed itself. Russia managed to get Crimea without losing a single soldier. And it was the easiness of the success that also very much shaped the opinion. And also, of course, there was a traditional Russian understanding that Crimea belongs to Russia, which was not born by Putin and which was not the result of Russian media. Basically, historically, the majority of the Russian population I have been reading the public opinion polls for the last 20 years. There is not a single year in which there was no majority in the Russian public that Crimea belongs to Russia. 
But the Russian television managed to achieve three things, and I, I want to, uh, to go on this. First, uh, the Russian television created this type of a conflict in which uh, everything that is happening is basically happening outside of the Russian control. It's very spontaneous, it's civil society. Uh, in the Russian political imagination for the Russian nationalists, what happened to Ukraine very much resembles what is happening to the Soviet political imagination with respect to the Spanish Civil War. And also what is true, that you have a lot of special forces in uh, Donbass, but also you have a volunteers. This is the case, and all the journalists, Western journalists being there, saying that many people are there not because Putin sent them, but because they decided to go there. The problem is, is Russian society ready to live with victims, with people being killed? One of the harshest things that the Putin government did is when they declared the foreign agents this uh, association of the Russian mothers, which basically said, tell that our kids have been killed and they are not buried. This is the biggest problem, because Russian society is quite modernized on the base of what I have been reading as a public opinion figures. For example, everybody is very happy about Crimea being part of Russia. Not very many people want the investment to be shifted from their region to Crimea. So from this point of view, Russians developed the American disease. They want to win without victims. Uh, and from this point of view, this is, uh, this is a major challenge. And I do believe that if uh, the conflict in uh, Ukraine is going to end up with more people being killed, with uh, more kind of a distraction, this is not going to be so easy uh, for the Russian propaganda to explain what is going on. Listen, on the level of the information, uh, we see what's happening in Ukraine in one way. If you read opinion polls, you're going to understand that uh, the Russian uh, public sees a totally different war. Uh, just to give you one figure, 72. 2% of the Russian public is convinced that it was the Ukrainians uh, that have uh, basically hit uh, the Malaysian uh, airplane. So from this point of view, it's totally mirror images. Uh, we're not sharing the same type of information space. Of course, here there are many people that does not share official position. It is there. But Russian society for the last two or three months was very politicized. They have been following uh, very actively what's happening in Ukraine. For the last one month, for the first time, you have 8% less of the people who basically declare that they're watching the news every night and so on. So there was this type of exhaustion. Uh, people cannot live only with what's happening in Eastern Ukraine. What could be the effect of this? For me, it's difficult to predict at this moment. Thank you. Yes, who has the microphone now? Yes, if you have the microphone. Um, hi, uh, my name is Patrick Labuda. I'm a PhD student here at the Graduate Institute. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you about the role of rationality in all this. Um, I mean, you, you've offered us uh, your sort of diagnosis of the situation, and I think you know we can agree or disagree with that, but it is an exercise in rationalization. Um, and you mentioned this phone call um, by uh, from An Angela Merkel to... Um, uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin, and you know his reaction, uh, where he said that uh, you know this is how our state functions; it's corrupt. But there was, of course, another phone call after which Angela Merkel fa very famously said that it's very difficult to negotiate with Putin because he's not rational. It seems like what he's doing is not rational. So I'm, I'm just wondering, what role does irrationality um, play in what Russia is currently doing? Do you think that we can ascribe importance to irrationality, or is this really a calculated move by the Russian president? Yeah. Thank you very much. The problem with irrationality is that when you say that somebody is irrational, this is the last sentence that you should make. Uh, and from this point of view, it's much more important to see in what context he's rational, basically how he's constructing the situation, basically in order to act rationally. But you made a much more important point, and this is to what extent, basically, Mr. Putin does not want to convince ourselves, ourselves that he's totally rational. We can expect anything, because this is how it functions, because any type of international order is based on certain expectations. And if you're totally unpredictable, uh, you're taking the initiative and you're in an advantageous position. This is the famous, basically, Nixon's position, because basically President Nixon was based his policy on the fact that he managed to convince all his opponents that he's so crazy, that he can do everything that they don't believe he will do. Does it mean that he was not 
rational? No, he was rational, and Mr. Kissinger was next to him, and he's not famous for being irrational. Uh, uh, but the basic problem is this is a very rational behavior. This is a very rational behavior. The problem with this rational behavior is it is very good to take the initiative. It is very difficult to sustain it over a very long period of time. Uh, because when somebody is going to do, uh, and you know this very well also from Jervis, perceptions, misperceptions, if you manage to provoke and in a certain way to make the other side to believe that they don't know what you're going to do anymore, you're in a very powerful position. But the level of unpredictability reaches the moment in which it can become also very dangerous for you. Because if NATO really believes that Mr. Putin is totally rational and he's ready to go to Warsaw or to Tallinn, this is also changing the calculus of the game. And I do believe from this point of view, I don't see Mr. Putin, honestly speaking, is irrational at all. I do believe that he's very much provocative. He has applied certain type of behavior which is very much in a tradition of the Russian gangsters culture of the 1990s which has its own rationality. First of all, is the most important in this culture is do not look weak. Weakness is something that should not be tolerated. Secondly, try to fight every concrete struggle as if this is the most important in your life. There is no small fights and big fights. And I do believe he's very good at uh, doing this. I do believe this also very much reflects the way the Russian society has been seeing the zero-sum game developed in the 1990s in the internal relations. Because it's not only what, for example, it was interesting. I was talking to one of the big business uh, persons who had been doing business in the 1990s in Russia. And he said, listen, what he's doing to Merkel today, he was doing this to us in the 2000s, for example, telling us, do your business, it's fine, no problem. The next day, basically, the police is coming, seizing your assets. He said, I didn't know about this. So this type of a game is not a new game, but it was very much new for us, because we have constructed Russia in the way to fit our perception of how the world should be. And now you have this type of a crisis of the assumptions of the Western policies. And of course, the biggest risk from the Western point of view is that in this game of escalation and de-escalation, rationality, rationality, European Union particularly can end up with this legendary boiled frog, where you basically, if you put a frog in a cold water, and if you start heating the water slowly, he can be boiled without understanding this. Uh, because we have so much an experience, basically, where is the red lines that should be defended. But I agree with you. I don't see Mr. Putin as irrational. By the way, I don't see anything that he was doing in his political career that was very much irrational. The only thing for me which was still very unexplainable was only his divorce. <laughs> <laughs> because I, do, I don't believe that his wife was so powerful to prevent him to do things that he wanted. Yes, other questions? Yes, there's a question here. Okay. This way? Yes. My name is Lee Weingarten. I'm a retired NGO worker. You mentioned that 72% um, of the uh, Russian population uh, believes that it was the Ukrainians who shot down the Malaysian plane. Um, I know that Mr. Obama and uh, Mr. Kerry immediately knew that Putin was responsible, but I'm wondering if there are any other people in this room who have heard evidence and very, very scientific evidence about a very different story. Yeah. To be absolutely honest, I don't know who hit the plane, but I know that on the level of the public opinion, 72% of the Russians are sure that it was the Ukrainians. To be honest, if you go on the Western public opinion polls, you're going to see much more people who said, I don't know. And from this point of view, uh, the fact is, and this is interesting about Russian propaganda machine, if you talk to people who have been much more studying the Soviet propaganda, they're going to tell you that Soviet propaganda was much less emotional. First, because television was then not what it is now. But secondly, because Soviet propaganda was also very much organized through different organizations, basically the Komsomol, the Communist Party, everybody is creating certain type of information, while basically the television was just the dessert. Here, you have a quite atomized society, and the television is very aggressive in the way they try to convince the persons 
and the audience certain things. There was a moment at some point of the crisis where the way uh, the Russian television was talking about the Ukrainian crisis was really amazing. For example, you're going to see this very old, and I had a huge sympathy for them, Ukrainian ladies who go and said this is worse, this is like Leningrad in 1941, and so on and so on. They're worse than, by the way, there was the Nazis the first two weeks, and they became the Germans after the third week. Listen, there was not like this. I mean, you cannot compare. And this type of a totally missed levels of comparison is something that makes this propaganda very kind of shocking, especially for somebody who is watching from here and not basically being part of the general environment where, where everybody is watching just this television. Thank you. There was a question just below there. Yes. Yes. Um, Raymond Janssons representing the permanent mission of Latvia here. Um, I was uh, very interested to hear your argument about uh, Russia's, uh, uh, that Russia intentionally is closing down her, herself already for a number of years and basically that's a that's a long-term strategy. Um, here in Geneva, what we see and what we have seen in, in, in the couple of years, last couple of years, that Russia has become a member of World Trade Organization. Uh, they are act actively participating there. There are trade disputes. Uh, we have seen that Russia is asking for a visa a liberalization with the European Union and uh, was very much interested in that. Um, uh, in my country, we see that uh, there is increasing people-to-people -people contacts. Uh, certainly, we hear a lot of Russian language, as you know, and, and also here in Geneva. So how um, uh, all these things are going together with your argument yeah. about intentionally yeah. closing down. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do believe, and this is a very important uh, uh, argument, I do believe that the general strategy of the Russian government was try to close Russia politically. And this is why economic, organizational part of the world, let's trade with the world, what we are not going to tolerate is basically intervention in our domestic politics. I do believe, and this was my major argument, that this changed very much in the winter of 2012, where this idea that we can be part of the global world economically, that we can be organizationally very much integrated, and at the same time, we can keep our political system closed. This is the moment in which I do believe that the Russian government perceived economic interdependency as a type of a threat. And then come this much more, as I told you, radical forms of cutting, like bank accounts uh, legislation. By the way, one of the latest idea that is discussed by the Russian Duma is strongly to increase the tariffs uh, for the uh, airplane tickets uh, when you're flying abroad and to decrease the tariffs when basically you're flying within Russia. So the idea of closing the country, there is a lot of legislative acts from the last one year, which at least in my view gives at least uh, some hope that what uh, I'm saying is not totally irrational. Thank you. Boris Engelson, a local journalist freelance. First concerning rationality, if anyone in this room has ever seen rationality east or west, he or she must be very old because I have never seen anything like that since my birth. But now, two ultra short questions. First, how do you explain the low profile of Turkey in the Ukrainian and Crimea crisis? Second question, is it a problem for Russia to be number one in size and probably number 10 and soon 20 in population? Yeah, uh, Turkey, I do believe that Turkey is now very much preoccupied with the crisis in the Middle East. The Syrian crisis is, from the strategic point of view, much more important for Turkey. No, but even, I do believe, for the last three years, for Syria is the major preoccupation of Turkish politics. So, nevertheless, the, the Turkish government shares many of anxieties, and I do believe discontents of the Russian government when it comes to some of the policies of the West. I don't believe that on a strategic level Turkey is ready to uh, join any type of a coalition with Russia. So this is why they're doing two different things. On one level, you, Turkey didn't join the sanctions. This is armed neutrality, as the Bulgarian state used to say in 1915. Uh, uh, talking about demography, uh, in 2008, uh, in my view, a very important uh, uh, study has been done in Russia trying to see among the elites which they see as the major problem of the Russian society and Russian state. And unlike many other studies, they were not giving them 
prepared answers. The idea was what is going to come naturally. 53% of the people that have been interviewed declared that demographic crisis is the biggest crisis that Russia is facing. And nevertheless, that there was a major improvement on the level, especially of the uh, life, uh, uh, the life of uh, the uh, life expectancy and so on. Russia, this is a major story because we're talking about a huge space which is very much depopulated. In Siberia, you have around 6 million people living basically in a territory which is much bigger than half of Europe. And this is creating a story because trying to develop these areas is becoming very difficult. Some of the major developing strategy of the Russian state are put under questions. Uh, by the way, now the around 28% of uh, the people who go from Ukraine to Russia and who are asking for Russian citizens, he has been relocated in Siberia. Uh, so Russia is trying to use part of this crisis to start to populate these areas and basically try to develop it. So from this point of view, I do believe that demography is the major problem and the major concern. It was recognized like this. It has a lot to do also with the uh, state of the Russian healthcare and uh, many other things. And also, don't forget, it's not simply that you don't have too many young people, and this explains why I don't believe that you have this type of a war mentality in Russia. Aging societies are not very keen war. They prefer to watch them on television. You don't have this surplus of young people that was so typical for the World War I uh, Europe, which explains part of what happened. Uh, but these demographic fears uh, can be seen in many things. For example, they can be seen is uh, some of the anti-immigrant sentiments, by the way, very shared from the point of view of their views towards immigrants. Russia is absolutely European society. Uh, it shares all our fears and uh, uh, anxieties about this. According to some studies in the year 2020, 20% of the Russian soldiers, I mean people who are on the soldier engage, uh, are going to be Muslims. So Russia is one of the European societies with the biggest percent of the Muslim population and the integration of this population have been highly problematic uh, in different parts of, uh, uh, of different parts of Russia. So I agree very much with you. I do believe that demography is a major factor and this is why probably Mr. Putin believes that Russia today is stronger than yesterday but not necessarily stronger than tomorrow. Thank you. I think we have time probably for another question if there is one. Yes. Yirko Tatiana, Nasza Gazeta, Geneva. Dr. Krastev, uh, do you think that uh, American and European sanctions could uh, change Russia, uh, Russia's policy in Ukraine in the long term? Listen, it's very difficult. And I'll start with the fact that uh, it's not true that the sanctions does not have any effect. You, it's enough basically to see uh, how much uh, uh, certain Russian businesses, basically, especially the cost of the capital has been very much increased. The problem is when to expect the change. And secondly, to what extent this change is also going to affect the level of economic interconnectedness that I have been talking about. I see the problem of the sanctions not so much from the point of view that our own European economies are going to be so much affected. To be honest, this is negative factor, it's not a dramatic factor. Compared with the money that, for example, has been given to the recovery of Greece, the money that Europe now is losing out of uh, the lost trade with Russia is much smaller. The biggest problem is that as a result of the sanctions, especially if the other global powers starts to believe that the West is trying to use its dominant position in the financial infrastructure of the world, if they do believe that we are ready to use this very much for political purposes, we are creating a very strong incentive in other players different than Russia to deglobalize. When tomorrow basically the Russians are going to come with the idea how to nationalize the internet, fearing that probably we can cut them, I'm sure that the Chinese, the Brazilians, the Indians are also going to try to be prepared for these policies. And my personal understanding is that part of the threat that Russia presents to the international order is very similar to the type of a terrorism presents to the constitutional order of liberal democracies. You should respond to this challenge, but not to respond in the way to destroy your own constitutional system as a result of response. From this point of view, overreaction, over-reliance on sanctions could be a problem too. Thank you very much. Let me thank uh, Dr. Krastyev in our name, and uh, uh, we hope to welcome him to the Institute once again in the future.